Chapter 10, Continuous Improvement. The main topic of this chapter is the content of Clause 10, which is also the last one of the standard. This clause is made of different subclauses, and each one talks about different ways to improve. As we said before, improvement is the ACT part of the PDCA cycle. Improvement is one of the key principles behind all ISO management system requirements, and finding ways to make the system better is ingrained in many of the processes. This is why we are monitoring, measuring, analyzing, and evaluating data gained through performance evaluation. We are doing it so that we can make data-based decisions to make the system better. Now that we are familiar with the concept of the PDCA cycle, we can go beyond that simple concept. Actually, the PDCA cycle is wrong. We said that the cycle is made of these steps, plan, then do, then check, then act. But there would be no point in going back to the first plan step. What would be the point of going back to what we started? What we really need is for the ACT step to be followed by another plan step in another cycle. So, overall, the actual PDCA is a spiral, a growing spiral. Little by little, this spiral works and leads to continuous improvement. We can try to make this concept clearer by making an example. We could use the process of training workers, which we used in, as the very first example, of a PDCA cycle, at the beginning of this course. The first PDCA cycle could be plan, planning how to train your workers, worker A will be trained on the 1st of November, worker B will be trained on the 3rd of October, worker C will be trained on the 11th of September. Do, actual training of workers A, B, C. Check. Let's make the workers do a final test to see if they actually learned what we wanted them to learn. In this example, A and B passed the test, while C didn't. I guess he was not paying attention. So, act. The action that has to be taken in order to tackle this problem is his retraining. The details of how to do it will be the main topic of the following cycle, because, as we said before, we have to move to another cycle. In this new PDCA cycle, the first step is planning the retraining of Worker C. The second step is making him attend the course in the do part. Then we have to check his test in the check part. And if he passes it, the act part will be to consider him trained, finally. And if he passes it, the act part will be to consider him trained, finally. What happens if he doesn't pass even the second time? Of course we will have to dig deeper. And what does dig deeper mean? Of course, another PDCA cycle. Subchapter 10.2 Incidents, Nonconformities, and Corrective Actions Let's dive directly into topic clause 10.2, which is called Incidents, Nonconformities, and Corrective Actions, and includes the requirements for a system to take corrective action when an OHS incident occurs such as an accident or near miss, or when you have a process nonconformity. The concept that your company has to do something when something bad occurs is easy and intuitive, maybe even banal. But the standard wants you to do it in a quite specific way that allows you to ensure that process problems that could reoccur are appropriately solved. In these slides, a simplified version of what the standard says in Clause 10 is presented. That complex clause is made into five simple steps that could be taken in this order, from the most urgent to the less one. It allows you to ensure that process problems that could reoccur are solved, and that you address the hazards that could lead to future incidents within your OHS. Some organizations might have separate processes to investigate incidents and process nonconformities. This appendix gives examples of incidents such as falls, nonconformities such as not meeting legal requirements, and corrective actions such as eliminating hazards that apply to the OHS. It is helpful to review these examples when creating your corrective action process and possibly include them in any documentation used to explain the process to workers. It's way easier to get these concepts if we go through a simple example. In this example, our worker is using a forklift. When all of a sudden, the forklift malfunctions, an incident occurs, and our worker gets injured. The very first step is reacting promptly to the accident or noncompliance. In our case, we have to take the worker to the infirmary, or maybe even to the hospital. Your company should make emergency plans that also cover these kind of events. In these situations, time is very precious, so being ready to face these situations could really make the difference between life and death. 
Then, your company should take action to keep them under control and correct them. This means, in this case, putting something on the forklift that prevents anyone that doesn't know the malfunctions from using it. Also, it means fixing the forklift by calling a specialized mechanic. So far, we just described what any company does when an incident occurs. But that's not enough, for sure. It's not a systemic way of dealing with problems. We want to go deeper, understand the real problem, and most important of all, preventing it from happening again. That's why at step three we put investigating the accident and determining the cause. Some organizations might have separate processes to investigate incidents and process nonconformities. Reasons to investigate a workplace incident include, most importantly, to find out the cause of incidents and to prevent similar incidents in the future, to fulfill any legal requirements, to determine the cost of an incident, to determine compliance with applicable regulations, for example, occupational health and safety, criminal, etc., to process workers' compensation claims. Who should do the investigation? Ideally, an investigation would be conducted by someone or a group of people who are experienced in investigative techniques, knowledgeable of any legal or organizational requirements, knowledgeable in occupational health and safety fundamentals, knowledgeable in the work processes, procedures, persons, and industrial relations environment for that particular situation, knowledgeable of requirements for documents, records, and data collection. In our example, we put just OHS specialist. Because most of the times, the OHS specialist is someone that is in that position exactly because he has these hard and soft skills. Step 4 consists in using the result of the investigation to find the proper corrective actions that eliminate the root causes of the accident so that they do not reoccur or occur elsewhere. In our example, the investigation found out that the company has no maintenance plan. It does maintenance only when they have a serious malfunction. So, the corrective action could consist in doing preventative maintenance managed through a maintenance plan. Finally, a more long-term task. Since your risk evaluation has to take into account the past incident, you must remember to update your risk evaluation accordingly. Maybe in your risk evaluation document, you stated that this kind of accident was unlikely. Well, now you should update it and state that it is quite likely. As you may already guessed, since this process is so relevant, it needs to be put into a documented information. The organization must keep documented information as evidence of the nature of the accidents or nonconformities and any subsequent action taken, the results of any corrective action, and action including their effectiveness. This document has many uses. Think of it as a diary. It helps your company keep track of everything that goes wrong and therefore act accordingly. For one last time, we are in the build part. How could you make a document that covers effectively what the standard asks? It's easier to divide it into two specific parts. One about what happened, events, and one about what your company will do to prevent it from happening again. For the event part, you could write type of event. Is it a nonconformity or a near miss or an accident? Description. Just write in your own words what happened. Immediate action. This is not the part about the more complex actions that your company will take. Just put here what your company immediately did. These are also called just corrections. Then, of course, the most important input of all, your root cause analysis. As we said before, don't think of the cause that literally caused your incident. Go back as possible to find the real reason why something happened. If someone slips on a banana peel, the real cause is not a banana peel was on the ground. The real cause is that someone, for a specific reason, thought that it was okay to throw a banana there. For the corrective actions, be as specific and concrete as possible. Resources. How much will your action cost? Responsible. Who will be responsible if it is not done? This is very useful to be sure that it is actually done. Date. This is also to be sure that this project doesn't get postponed continuously. Effectiveness. Just write if it was done or not, and with what results. This is probably the best time in the course to give a very important disclaimer about the difference between improvement actions and corrective actions. Both of them have to be planned with details about resources, responsibilities, date, effectiveness. So this point is quite clear. The 45001 standard doesn't want ideal or rhetoric actions. They have to be specific and planned with concrete details. This is needed because good planning helps in making what is planned come true. What about differences? As their name says, improvement actions can be done when there is a situation that is already compliant. So, it's done as an improvement to prevent something bad from happening before it happens. On the other hand, 
Corrective actions are used to face a nonconformity. They are done after something wrong happens. If something is not clear about this difference, please let us know through our email, and we will help you regarding this matter. With this chapter, we almost ended our course. We learned how to seek continuous improvement through the basic tools of the management system. To be specific, we learned the key role of recording negative events, nonconformities, and plan an adequate response to them. With this chapter, we covered all the contents of the 45001 standard. That's why, in this picture, you can see that we almost got to the top. The following chapter is just a brief recap of the documents needed to build your 45001 system. If you need some help or have any question on these topics, please send us an email at occam at occam-consult.com.